Today, I have a very special guest, and it's John Pepper, and he will tell you about his story, his uh, Parkinson's story, and how he become better. So please, John, start telling a little about yourself, where you live, and when uh, you notice something was wrong in your life. I was born in England five or six years before the war started. That's the Second World War, not the first. And um, we lived through the bombing in London and we, we had a bomb land in our garden that didn't go off, a very big one. And we thought that's the time to leave. So we left London in 1941 or 42. We lived around various places around the country for, for the next six or eight years. I went to school in Winchester and I worked in a bank for a year. And because my father sent and took me out of school and sent me to work to help make money. So um, in 1952, the, the whole family um, immigrated to South Africa, where I worked in the same bank for four years. And then I joined a company selling accounting machines. And then I went and opened up a business of my own uh, printing. And that business grew and grew and grew until it was the biggest one of its type in the country, making um, paper for uh, these big computers, because not too many other printers knew anything about computers. And um, we became the biggest computer printing company in the, in the country. At that stage, we went public on the stock exchange. And my whole world fell apart because I was no longer able to talk to people. I couldn't address meetings. I was a real mess because my Parkinson's symptoms started the day or the year that I started the printing business. And that, that business was a very stressful business, but I enjoyed every minute of it. And, but that year, I found that I couldn't throw a ball or a dart or any object from my hand it went anywhere, nowhere close to where I was trying to aim. And then the symptoms, um, mainly insomnia and um, uh, tummy troubles. Uh, I can't think of the word at the moment. My tummy doesn't work. Uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. When I think of it, I'll tell you. And so how old it, were you at that time? I was 29, I think. Is Okay. Um, 1963. Yes, I was 29. So I assume that's early onset Parkinson's. So every year, or more, more than once a year, I, another symptom came and the doctor gave me this medicine and that medicine for each one. And the constipation, which is the word I couldn't think of, has been with me since then. And it's, it's given me huge troubles. And it's a very common um, um, symptom for people with Parkinson's. I, I would be surprised if they don't all have constipation. Anyway, I still deal with that problem. It, it's, it's, a, it's a daily problem and I've learned to live with it. So at the time of, um, in 1999, that's many years later, my company was taken over in a hostile fashion and I was booted out. I was worthless to the company. I had already resigned as the chairman because I was unable to communicate with anybody. I, was, I couldn't walk properly. I couldn't do most things. You know, with Parkinson's, what you get like. And two years, for the next two years, I sat at home mainly, but I used to go to the gym every morning at six o'clock and do an hour and a half gym. Unfortunately, my symptoms continued to get worse. And after two years, I stopped going to the gym because it's, it's not easy doing gym every day for an hour and a half when it's not doing anything for you. So I stopped going to the gym and my late wife was very upset with me because it, I, she had been doing something called Walk for Life. And they have this program all over the world, I think, but it doesn't matter. It's certainly more all over South Africa where they recommended walking three times a week for a maximum of one hour as fast as you can. And it, it, it helped people to get better from all sorts of um, physical um, um, illnesses. And 
my late wife had lost 14 kilograms in weight, which is why she went there. And she stopped taking all her blood pressure pills and antidepressants. Now I would imagine that the blood pressure and the antidepressants were being taken because of me, because I was working 24 and a half hours a day and there was no home life. She was bringing up children and it was very really tough for her. But um, she was a wonderful person and she went there to lose weight because she had become a little bit overweight. She wasn't, wasn't badly overweight. So she lost 14 kilograms and she said to me, John, why don't you try it? Because other people with all sorts of other illnesses have got better because of doing it. So I said, I'm, going, I'm doing gym for 90 minutes every day and you want me to spend an hour three times a week, which is only you know, 60 minutes, three times a week. How can it help me? And she says, I don't know, but I know it does. So I said, okay, rather than fight about it, I'll join. And I joined, and within four months, some of my symptoms had already started getting better. The biggest one, the easiest one to notice is when I did my first walk, you're not allowed to walk for more than 10 minutes, but as I had been walking 20 minutes in the gym every day on the treadmill, she allowed me to walk for 20 minutes. And I went for that first day that I walked, it was over 12 minutes a kilometer. And um, so, I worked, walked less than two kilometers in that 20 minutes. After two months, I was already down to around 10 and a half minutes a kilometer. And going on and on and on, um, within four years, I was down to doing nine kilometers an hour. Now that's a huge improvement. But not only had my walking improved, but I noticed that I was speaking better. I wasn't um, stuttering and, and um, unable to speak hardly at all. Um, I was sleeping a lot better, although it's not what anybody would call sleeping. I used to sleep for three hours a night. And I got down to sleeping for, for five hours at that time after three, four years of walking. I, I was quite happy about that because I was writing a whole suite of programs on my computer, which kept my mind busy. And I think that's something that everybody should do, not on computers necessarily, but keep your mind active. Not just reading, that's not keeping your mind active, that's keeping your time, you know, having something to do. Writing a computer program is really difficult and, um, and taxing on your nerve, on your brain. And I'm sure it did me a lot of good, but, I was still working 14 hours a day on the computer. <laughs> and anyway, that's what I spent my time on. And I achieved what I wanted to achieve. I had a very good system, but I never sold it to anybody. The whole point was to keep busy and have a, have a goal. But in that time, I then started getting, um, I joined Parkinson's, South African Parkinson's Association. And within 12 months, I was chairman of that association because nobody else wanted to do it. And for five years, um, I was chairman of that organization. Um, in this period, uh, when I was doing the walking and uh, up to 19, uh, 2002. In 2002, I had been going to see several of the Parkinson associations throughout South Africa. My late wife and I used to like traveling, so we went to all these big cities, Cape Town and Durban and, so, and, and Pretoria and Bloemfontein, all the big cities. And I took people who, one guy was in bed, two or three were in wheelchairs. And I took them out of bed and out of the wheelchair and showed them immediately how to walk. And then they were walking immediately around on their own without me helping them. And people who froze, you, you know what freezing is. Yeah, yeah. And I say to them, show me, just stand with me. And if you can stand up on your two legs, and can you stand on one leg and show me how far you can put the other leg out in front of you? And they do just that. I say, okay, stand on the other leg and stick the other, your first leg out in front of you. They did that. So can you stand up on your toes? And they stood up on their toes. I said, there's no reason why you can't walk. Ah, oh, but we have Parkinson's. 
I said, so have I, but I can show you how to walk now. Would you like to see? Yes, please. So I hold their arms and I say to them, I don't want you to try and will yourself to walk, which is what you're doing. I want you to think of putting your weight on one foot and sticking the other leg out in front of you and landing on the heel. Can you do that? Yes. And we do it and we start walking. And within a minute, we're walking quite at quite a good pace. And they say, come on, we go faster and faster. And I kept on going faster and faster with these people who couldn't move a minute ago. Now, I have not yet come across anybody in the world who couldn't do that. The only person who couldn't do it, he, he, he was unable to stand on his own two legs. He couldn't take the weight of his body on his legs. So I couldn't show him how to walk. But I, I would, if I'd been given time and if I lived close to him, I could have got him walking. He, he had no strength because he hadn't done any exercise for years. And he was a little bit older than I was, but I was quite still youngish at the time, in my 70s and 80s or whatever it was. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I've been doing. And in, in 2002, um, a lady came, one of the, one of the vice chairmen of the, of the association in, in South Africa. I'd been chairman for five years at that stage. And she said to me, um, John, uh, I think we should try and get a, a different chairman every now and again, because the same person, it becomes boring for everybody. And, you know, and other people want to give it a try. I said, well, that's fine. I'll, I don't mind not standing. I don't have a lot of time for doing it anyway. So she took over. She was voted in. And two weeks later, I was asked to resign as vice chairman because I was telling people that I was cured and I was telling people that they can do this and they can do that, which was a whole lot of lies. And I was not in the condition to be able to fight them on it because she didn't do that. So either the doctors got together and did that because I tried to get the doctors to see what I was doing and they weren't interested. But I, I suspect that it was far greater than the, just the doctors. I think the whole and the whole pharmaceutical industry was could stand to lose because I don't take any medication and I haven't um, been to see a, a neurologist since 2001, I think 2002 or something. Other than I had, I did see one in um, 2000 and. 12 when I moved, or 2013, after I wrote my book, my first book, everybody said, but well, you don't have Parkinson's. I said, well, let me go to another neurologist and let them tell you I have Parkinson's. So I went to two different neurologists and they both agreed that I do have Parkinson's, even though I was able to do all this walking. I had all these other symptoms which they could pick up straight away. The tremor, you can pick up immediately. I can't do much about the tremor. I can concentrate on holding my hand still and you can see it's more or less still but when I write it shakes and when I, I bring food to my mouth it shakes I'm quite happy to live with that I'm living a normal life other than I got the shakes and once you get used to it and it's not eating me up that I've got these shakes and that I'm not embarrassed by it um, I, you know Maybe it, it's difficult to eat sometimes, but people get used to seeing me using a spoon to eat or turning the fork upside down and putting the food on the fork because I can't use the fork normally. And I find it a battle to cut things and so my wife does the cutting. So is that a big deal, either of those two things? I live a normal life at the age of 87. There are not too many people who live and do all the things that I still do. So that's really the story but in a nutshell the bump that landed in your garden how did that affect you as a child i've had seven experiences in my life where there's no ways i should have lived me and a lot of other people around me i was six years of age when this happened one of these big bombs that they drop by parachute, it's so big and they want it to explode above the ground. The moment these pins that stick out of the, the side of the bomb, the moment it touches the ground or touches a ship, you've got the mines in the water and the ships touch the mines and the ships blow up. This five ton or 10 ton bomb dropped by parachute and it landed 
on our hawthorn hedge. And it, it landed exactly like this, not like this, but like that, exactly on a two foot, not even an 18 inch wide hedge. What is the chance of that bomb landing on a hedge and not going off? It's, it's well, we, it didn't go off and it, it was a chance. And later on, I, I won't tell you all the seven, but there was, we, my whole family were in a plane that, that crashed. And that was fairly recently, this, in the last 15 years. The plane just never took off. It was flying down the runway, and when it got to the end of the runway, it couldn't get up in the air because it wasn't going fast enough. And we found out afterwards that those two pilots had never flown that plane before. Uh. And it was because the company who made that plane, I won't even tell you which one it was, told the, the company, every airline, if you, can drive, if you can fly one of their model airplanes, because they had several models from small to big, then you can fly all of them because they've all got the same system, the same everything. So they were just told, well, you fly this plane and they believed they could fly this plane. So they got in it and they couldn't fly the plane. It hit the lights at the end of the runway and burst four tires. Now, those tires, when they burst, they make a huge explosion. And that explosion with the tires, the tires fell into pieces and they broke holes in the wings and in the fuselage of that plane. And there was petrol leaking out of those holes, running out of those holes. Now, why we didn't catch fire then, I don't know, because there's all this petrol flying out. And I'm sure there must have been sparks all over the place because we were still virtually on the ground. Our wheels were on the ground. They, were, they bashed against these lights and broke and, and punctured the wheels. So, but then we carried on and eventually they, they couldn't get any height. They stayed at the same height, but the ground fell away. So they were flying at, um, 10, 15, 20 feet above the ground. Slowly, they couldn't get the flaps up and they couldn't get the wheels up. So they had all this stuff hanging down underneath. And very close to the airport, about a mile away past the runway, is a big building with the supermarkets. It's seen, uh, fortunately, it was only a single story building, but it was still quite a big building. And we missed that building by about that much. So twice now, in, 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 inside of a minute, we should have lost our lives. We flew around for two hours getting rid of uh, fuel, and we got, eventually got back and, try, and we landed. We had to land with only six wheels. And they all burst when we touched the ground because they couldn't take the weight of the plane. It was still full of people. So all these tires burst and they were running on the rims of the tires and all that petrol still dripping out or pouring out. We should have caught fire and we didn't. We missed the, and we got to the end of the runway and we managed to stop. And I don't need to tell you the rest of the story. How we survived that, I do not know. And how did, we survived did, did that bomb. Did it affect your symptoms? I'm sure it did. Um, but I'm not a person who, who can't get over, you know, during the war with the bombing all the time, even as a child, you got used to it. Um, you, you got used to the fact that a bomb might kill you tonight. It isn't that it only happened once or twice. It happened every night for months, you know, and we had air raid shelters, but if a bomb dropped on a shelter, you wouldn't have lived. So we were used to, as children, and we're living um, as, as um, refugees for, for six or seven years after that, because um, we didn't have a house to live in and so forth. Anyway, um, well, when I grew up before the next, the next time I should have died, um, I didn't think about those things. I was thinking more about girls and about um, bicycles and and, and um, buying a car and all and like everybody else I wasn't I never thought of myself as as um, an invalid although I had all these um, health problems nobody else knew this I mean you don't go around saying look I got um, I didn't know I had Parkinson's but all these things that used to go wrong and like the tummy problems you get on with your life. I was a young man. I, I was keen to get out there and do things, dancing and, and so forth. My father took me out of school. I went to a good school in England, a public school. 
um, which for which I had uh, won a scholarship to get into that public school. But I was 10 years old when I got into that school and all the other boys were 12 and 13 years old, which is when you go to high school. So I was really badly bullied in that school because I was, I was a little boy and they were young men and they were going through puberty and I was still a little boy. And my life was a real misery from that. Yes, that had a big effect on me. Yeah. And I became a loner. I, I, there's no way I would make a friend at school because they were, they were out of my class, both socially and age-wise. So I went through that school always being two or three years younger than, than everybody else in my class. And I had nobody to, to, as a friend, I had to walk to school or cycle to school, which was seven miles. And I had a tough life, but that toughness had more effect on the negative side of all the things that have happened to me. I was fighting a battle to survive all my life. My nickname at school, my young brother, he, uh, we all the same, uh, my young brother was Scruffy, Scruffy Pepper. My name was Barn Doors. Now, why Barn Doors? The, the patches on my clothes were so big, they were as big as Barn oh, Doors. Okay. And my older brother, he was, he, was Pat, he was Patchy Pepper and the other one was Scruffy Pepper. So we had no clothes. My mother had to make clothes from second hand or third hand clothes. And, and to, to go, and imagine going to a public school, not wearing the public school uniform because we couldn't afford it, and wearing patched up clothes that, I mean, we really looked untidy. I looked very untidy. So they couldn't tell me that to leave because I couldn't buy, it was during the war. so. Um, I couldn't, we couldn't buy a suit. You couldn't get one anyway, but they, they had secondhand ones that they could get from boys growing up. So somehow or another, they got used to the fact that I was this very untidy person that nobody talked to and no, nobody knew anything about. He just came to school, he did this and he did his homework and we, he came to school again tomorrow, you know. So that was my school career. and. As a person, as a loner, I was so used to not having people helping me, um, coming to me and saying, look, if you do this, I'll do that and so forth. I was on my own. Yeah. And in that business, we didn't have any money. We had enough money to start that business to buy the machinery. So we didn't owe any money. So we being a man whose name is Salter, S-U-L-T-E-R, we thought Salter and Beth Pepper would go very well together. <laughs> business <laughs> it had nothing to do with the success of the company so anyway with my knowledge of computers and my London and my ability to just be positive I, we started that business it just grew and grew and grew and growing is very um, it, it's very uh, stressful because we had more we needed more machines and we needed a bigger bigger um, place to, to work so we changed factories about four times before we in a factory big enough to do the work we were doing. And we never had any money because it was all going into the business. But I was achieving huge successes. And it never sort of entered my mind that um, I was, all I know is my business was getting bigger and we were getting more customers. We moved to Johannesburg and we went overseas to buy a bigger press and everything just kept on growing and growing and growing until eventually, we had four factories in South Africa printing over a million rands worth of printing a day. And um, that stress nearly killed me yeah. because I did, had no education to go with it. I, the only thing is I solve problems as and when those problems arise. And that's what I've been good at all my life. So and one thing I, one thing I have observed, with in my clients is that a uh, stress can also be uh, something that feel good so when you have all this company going on i guess it was um, some sort of exciting and and uh, fulfilling and uh, you get a lot of, lot of good feedback because things was growing 
So stress is not only anxiety and trauma. It can also be you pushing yourself. No, that's right. That's right. You've hit the nail on the head. I had all the benefits of the success. At the same time, I was stressed to the limits. But because it was a challenge and because we were win winning those, everything that challenges, we, we won the, the, the battle. We succeeded in overcoming those challenges. So I'm just a person who's positive, positive, positive. And I don't, I, when a problem comes up, I find an answer to that problem. I don't hang around and say, oh God, you know, I can't do it. Nobody can help me. And I've got no money and I've got no clothes. Oh, me, poor me. <laughs> it so is the, attitude. Attitude. So, so the day your wife said that you should join the walking, yes. what was your thought about walking and Parkinson's? Would it help you? Did you believe it would help you? No, I didn't believe it would help me. But because within a week I had improved already, because I started, I could only walk for two weeks for 20 minutes. But the distance I covered by the end of the two weeks was far greater than the distance I covered in the first day. That told me that I was improving. And I carried on improving. And I didn't think of what if and what if and what if. I didn't think of the Parkinson's. I never think about the Parkinson's. When I started um, as chairman of the Parkinson's Association in South Africa, and I saw how other people were freezing and all these other things, I started showing them how to walk. I didn't know that what I was doing uh, helps you in actual fact produce more dopamine in your brain. Some of them carried on doing it and most of them didn't because their doctors told them it would be dangerous. If they fall, they're going to hurt themselves. So they stopped doing the walking. So uh, it was... The, on the on the um, doctor's side, on the medical uh, the uh, medical profession side, I've had nothing but um, opposition. I've had no help whatsoever, other than from my own doctor. He did a great deal to help me, and and he he also warned me that I, I was taking chances. But you know, if nothing happens and you're taking a chance, well, nothing's going to happen. You know, um, so. Uh, but I got no, no other than Col uh, Colin is his name, um, his his help and encouragement. I don't think I would have carried on, uh, you know, to start the walking in the first place. So, so it was important to have someone supporting you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, well, my family supported me. I mean, they they've been behind me, even though I work so hard. Uh, we did a lot of things together because I never worked at weekends. Weekends was family time. So right now, are you walking together with other people or alone? No, I, walk, I walk on my own. Um, yeah. I get up six o'clock in the morning still and I do my walking. Start for, for doing a kilometer to start with every second, every second day. And then when the next problem hits, I'm probably doing three kilometers by then because I only increase this, the distance every two weeks. Yeah. So I, I start you know, for 20 minutes. And then I build up to, to 25, 30 minutes and then something goes wrong. And then I start again after I've got over the problem and I go stop at 20 minutes again. <laughs> and at the moment, I've got to start tomorrow at 20 minutes again because uh, I've just got over this fall now. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll go fine. Uh, I would love to still go around showing people how to do the walking because nobody seems to do it without being shown how to do it so maybe you know norman deutsch have you come across norman deutsch no i have -O -I -D -G -E. norman deutsch wrote a book i don't know 10 or 12 years ago called the brain that changes itself yeah he believes that the brain can change it can overcome problems itself it finds way of overcoming problems when he heard about my story he he came to see me I showed him what I did and I took him around to a whole lot of meetings in Durban and Cape Town and in Johannesburg, showing people who were freezing and not being able to walk at all and showing in front of him how I did this. And he wrote a second book, which has got my story in it. 
of what I did and what I was, what my brain was doing. Because he says it's proof that the brain does change itself. And I'm sure the brain changes itself. But I know how it changes itself. It changes itself because I'm producing more GDNF. Um, GDNF is something the brain produces. Have you, do you know what the term growth factor is? Yeah. Every cell in your body produces growth factor. Ah, because, yeah, okay. Because when you injure yourself, if you didn't have growth factor, you would die. You have to cut yourself and you carry on bleeding until you die. Every cell that we've got replaces the, the, the damaged cells. So it's called a growth factor. Now, the growth factor for the, the cell that's, that Parkinson's injures and, and kills is the glial cells. The glial cells in the substantia nigra, which is down here, I think. And um, when you do the walking, this, this test that, that um, Mayo Clinic did, and they are part of the medical profession, forget, don't forget, and they published this, but no, they haven't told anybody about it. So they published it, I'll send it to you, okay? And um, it has proved that every time you do the walk, you produce X percent of new GDNF every time. And that repairs more brain cells. And every time you walk, you produce more brain cells and you start getting better, which is what every Parkinson patient should be doing. I don't care whether they think they can walk or not, they can walk consciously. And I will show them how to do it. And I'll try and teach other people to show other people how to do it. But it's got to be a Parkinson patient. Now, I get people coming to see me from all over the world. Um, and being shown these things and going oh, okay. back, yeah. So um, and I can connect you with several of them. So um, you know, I, I'm, I've got quite a wide range of people speaking to me from all over the world, including Japan, nobody in China, um, and everywhere. Uh, anyway, how do you prefer people to learn more about your way of? Thinking well, I think they need, they need to read my book. I'm not trying to sell books. I, I don't try and sell my book at all yeah. uh, anywhere. But it's on um, Amazon. Yeah. And um, if it's they go to Amazon, reverse Parkinson's, reverse Parkinson's disease. disease, you go to Amazon, it'll give me my name and you can order the book. Yeah. Um, the thing is, you've got to understand what I've been telling you before you can start going forward. This business of you know, living from pill to pill is not a, not a way to go because the more pills you take, the more you have to take. And the more pills you have to take, the closer you get to having dyskinesia, which is a side effect of the pills. It's not a, it's not a Parkinson's symptom. And when you get to having dyskinesia and you can't you know, hold your body, you know, Michael J. Fox and all these people have been there. And I haven't been to that because I have ne never got that bad. But because I haven't taken that many amount of medication, it took it for two years, it was only three pills a day. And um, uh, anyway. My idea is to collect more people. So I'm um, making interviews with the ones that I uh, find so people can see that it's possible to do something. Yes. Because walking is, as I told you, one of the, it's part of the pattern I saw that people were using to become better. Yes. You see, run, running can't do this. You cannot run flat out for an hour. Nobody can. You can run fastish, you know, to, at a good pace, but you can't run flat out. You can walk flat out yeah. for an hour. You can't just start off with because after five minutes you finished, you know, but you still. It, every second day you do it and slowly you build it up to six minutes and seven minutes and ten minutes and you know and we, it, it gets better and so do you okay yeah but you can do it with walking and it's safe to do it with walking so what do you think about the my idea that we need to collect people that have any ideas about how to become better or Professionals. I think, it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea, and I will give you every information I've got. Well, I have used a lot of times for five years, so I have um, found my own way of thinking about this. Are you okay. interested in hearing that? Yeah. Okay. 
So it was my idea to collect people on this, to make it a portal. So here um, under Get Help, I have a shop where I will put a link to your book. So here's to, to put a good help for people with chronic diseases. So I have made an, an online course with my knowledge and Gary Sharp has, and then there's other books. So I'll put your book in here. And then it was my idea that um, professionals that have something on their heart, they could um, put it in the calendar here because a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. And as I told you, I can see the patterns across all these peoples. Um, and I have a block with uh, people that do all other sorts of things that help them. Um, so that was my idea to collect all help on this side. Well, I wish you a great deal of luck and I hope you're very successful. And it's not easy, out. it's not easy, but... Um, I'm sure. I'm, uh, I, I've been trying to do that, but um, not as a full-time job. I, I'm, I've rewritten my books. I've got three books now, um, one, two on my life. Uh, I couldn't get it all in one book. And the other one is on Parkinson's. Yes. And I, have, I keep, keep rewriting the Parkinson's book because I pick up all these things like this uh, report from Mayo Clinic and people who write to me and tell me that they've got better and, and, and so forth, I put their names and, and what they've told me into the book because I'm not making these things up and, and everybody knows who everybody is. So um, what's... This, is, this is what I've been doing flat out 14 hours a day. So my it was age. my idea to put in professionals, for example, and um, collect people that sort of fit in my theory about uh, what helps here. And- oh, um, I wish you luck in that side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I found out that um, it's this adrenaline that is the problem. And uh, you can tell me, for example, you have some tremor left. Is it the same? all day and all night or is it sometimes smaller and sometimes bigger if i'm stressed in other words something is worrying me i shake quite badly yeah and that and was my idea that everybody tells that story and for a hundred years the belief was that you would just have parkinson and there was nothing to do now there's an upcoming belief that uh, there's a core of symptoms and a lot of stress and instead of thinking about the symptoms and what you cannot do, we, everybody on earth know that you can do something about stress. So what I concentrate is to help people remove any stress that they have in life. Um, and it can be current things or it could be things from their past. Well, so I've people... Got I've got that in my book, you know, quite a lot yeah. about stress management. Yeah. So, so that's what I help people to get closer and closer to if there is a solving core, the problem. Or, or maybe yeah, solving the finding the root cause on the um, their stress, and it can be their job situation or relationships. Or that's right. That's it can right. be past. They they can do something about it. They can solve those problems and, instead and then, of living with those problems. And then see what's left and, and people slowly um, reduce their symptoms. And I keep a pretty, can you call detailed uh, diary. I help people to write down their symptoms so we can track their improvement. Okay. So they become better and better while 
reducing stress and me also coaching them to to do whatever is possible and one of the things is for example uh, walking um, and it could also be other things so to get people more active and reduce stress is uh, to keep it very short can i tell you something while it goes through my mind yes one of the big things that i found um, uh, is that parkinson's affects the subconscious brain the area of the brain that you doing things that you don't have to think about when you walk you don't think about what your legs are doing when you bring food to your mouth you don't think what your hand and, and arm are doing when you're writing you don't think about how you're writing you're thinking about what you're writing so the conscious brain thinks about what i'm going to say and the subconscious brain tells your hand how to say it now most of the things we do we do subconsciously and walking is one of them now i've learned to take control of my brain from many things in other words i take over from the subconscious and consciously do things see things through that like this concentrating on you can see my hands are not shaking there because i'm concentrating the right hand is not doing so well but it's better than nothing and i, I can concentrate on that when i'm not concentrating then they go like this yeah so if you can learn to use your conscious brain which is very difficult because it's so unnatural you don't have to think about walking normally but if you do think about walking when you are walking you can walk a lot better a lot safer and a lot faster yeah okay and it is that secret of using your your conscious brain to do all the things because your conscious brain has not been damaged in any way whatsoever by parkinson's it may so be damaged by medication but it won't be damaged by parkinson's I, I i cannot tell you how bad my parkinson's was other than the fact that they threw me out of my own job my own business because it was a public company and they were able to do so so i don't think about uh, you know feeling sorry for myself and you know and then stop taking pills because doctors tell me to do this and do that i'm always trying to find a way to overcome things you know yeah i'm looking for solutions not problems yeah but you are right what i'm doing i'm trying to build up to an understanding and why understand you know, yeah uh, it's a wonderful what you're doing is wonderful because that's the beginning of finding solutions yeah so just to uh, tell you that i have one client that uh, it was maybe he wasn't affected a lot but he has got the diagnosed parkinson and he hasn't the doctors has declared him free of parkinson's now what did he do uh, i helped him with some terrible childhood trauma he had okay so um, you know a fight with his between his mother and father with the uh, knives and blots and he being only four years old i can understand that yeah and he got a, a tremor because every time he was out shopping he was looking for dangerous people in the crowd oh. so he when i met him he could only shop during the morning where there was no people and round and after clearing this terrible trauma of his he didn't have that fear anymore it's he's, a, cha he's changed his way of thinking he has changed his way of thinking right. about these situations right. yeah so um, um it, it's a very short story most is he at but it's in, in line uh, you you're teaching him how to consciously do something to overcome that problem you've you've found the problem and now you've also found a solution to that problem which involves him consciously doing something differently yeah you could that was a way of explaining it yeah because your conscious brain uh, deals with every part of your life and your body and everything yeah. so it, uh, it, it initiates everything so every person is different and and some um they if they sit in the chair all the day they need to 
to get out walking Absol and get active. Absolutely. Uh, and that could change a lot. And hmm. some people are already active and they need to do other things. You're just backing up what I'm saying. The, I'm backing up what you are saying completely. Yeah. I'm trying to explain why people end up in this um, yes. disease. I admire you being able to work with that because I would find it very distressful working with people that I don't understand how they can react to what's happened to them. Yeah, but you know? I get the, I think it's, you know, like a, um, it's a riddle to find out what's the problem in each person. So I don't yes. find it devastating, but... Um, you see, finding the problem is not getting the solution, but it, it's a one way, it, it's the first step before looking for a solution. Yeah. If you know what's causing it, then you can find a solution. Yeah. You can't take away the, the cause. The cause has happened and it can never be taken away. So, I, I mean, all the bullying that I went through as a child, I can't take that away. I had to learn to defend myself and to look after myself because nobody else was doing it. And that's so, what, that worked. It was a good strategy for years and years. But you yeah. know, in, in coaching and therapy, we have a saying and it can sound um, provoking, but we can say it's never uh, too late to get a good childhood. Absolutely, absolutely. To overcome the childhood, not, get, not make it better, but overcome it. Yeah. You can't change what was. You can change their reaction to what was. Yeah. The reaction and the feeling connected. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You've got to that... learn to, you have to learn to forgive. Yeah. It was so... one of the first lessons I learned in my life in, with these bullies and so forth was to forgive them because they don't know any better. And I was small and they were big and they were older than I was and they could do what they liked with me. Yeah. But I still came back and... Yeah. If you don't forgive what caused you your problem, you will never get away from your problem. And it's also, as you said, a way of um, rethinking uh, a problem. Yes, of course. Yeah. If you if you take away the thorn out of the out of your flesh, then you can then you can heal. But you can't heal when the thorn is still in your flesh. Yeah. So that was a good metaphor for what I'm doing. Yeah. Well done. People. Yeah. And uh, yours very good and practical way that most people can do walking. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, maybe I can ask to. I can maybe put a one of your videos after this, so people can see it if you like to. I leave that to you, um, but I'll send you the three or four or five videos that I've got. Yeah. And, and you can, I didn't make any of those videos, by the way. They're made by Deutsch and other people. Ah, okay. Okay. So um, I've, I've done very little to promote myself, quite frankly, other yeah. than writing my book. Yeah, but it's also difficult, as you tell, because I'm also being thrown out of hundreds of, uh, of uh, not hundred, but a lot of Facebook groups because they don't allow a person like me either to tell something that can help. Right. Yeah, you, know, you can't use Facebook to sell a product. No. I'm not selling a product. I'm, I'm selling knowledge. Yeah. I'm not selling it because I don't charge for it. I'm just parting with knowledge. Yeah. The problem is what you don't pay for, you don't appreciate. So. Uh, that's yeah, you are right, and, and people, it's easier when people are committed to yes. do things. Yeah, no, absolutely. I got a, an email from somebody today, which I put into my book already for the next edition. Ah. And uh, he, it's, it was really short and sweet. It's changed his whole life. He's got his health back, and he just wants to tell me that He's, he's grateful, you know. It was about six lines. He doesn't have to tell me any more than that. Yeah, but that's why we're doing it. I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. the, the people who do it and find out it works. The number of people who do it or half-heartedly, they don't like walking, so 
they do it under 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 um, whatever's the word uh, you know they're not really wanting to do it and then after three weeks they say no they prefer running or they prefer rowing or whatever it is so you do you do what you want to do it, yeah you know what will work if you do it and you don't know anything else but that's I your have, choice that's i your have choice. a similar story i have uh, arthritis in my both knees and i have to stop all sport when i was 20 and couldn't i didn't have pain all the time but i should just step on a branch or a, a step on a stair and then i had terrible lightning pain in my knees and then i was like that for 20 years and and uh, then a doctor told me that i should do biking and it took me two years to persuade myself to do it but going into a gym with a bike it's so boring terrible music and <laughs> I share your doing, views. Doing one hour a week for uh, three months, and my pain has gone, and I have no pain in nearly fifteen you, you years. See, you're doing weight bearing, and you're not doing weight bearing exercise. You're not carrying your weight on a bicycle. You're merely using your leg, which is part of it, but the the difficult part is your weight. Yeah, you're carrying this huge amount of flesh. But you know. after that, I, in the last four, five years, I've started walking because now I didn't get the pain in my knees. Yeah, okay. So now I do long distance walking. Not always fast. I can walk very fast, but I maybe last time I walk was 42 kilometers. Wow. Oh. So, so uh, you don't do speed walking, obviously. No, because I'm often in a group. It's too boring to walk yeah. so such a long time. But it, it's often six and a half kilometers an hour. So what you're doing is good. Yeah. It's not going to do anything for Parkinson's, but you don't have Parkinson's. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, the idea is that nearly regardless of which disease you have, uh -huh. Walking would help people. Oh, absolutely. Biking Health would help everything. people. We have a Dane in. Uh, we have a Dane with sclerosis. She ran a marathon every day in a year to get rid of her sclerosis. And now I think she is close to a thousand marathon. That was her way of becoming better. So. Everyone must find their own way, but walking is um, like biking in a gym and walking uh, like you have been doing. It's one of the best things because you do not hurt your feet and, and knees doing these things. And with your, um, I would call it mindful walking that you are very aware of each step, it's super. Absolutely. That's just so, what I do. And Every step. I mean, most, as you tell, most people would be able to walk. And if they can walk 10 steps this right. week, they can maybe walk, walk 20. 12 steps next week. Yeah. And just to, to um, make, take a little longer time or a little faster, or whatever is possible, just believe in, that you can become better. And, yes. and after some time, you can s see and feel that something good is going on in your body, regardless of you, what symptoms you have. Well, I mean, if you read Doida's book, it tells you exactly what she's saying. Yes. So more and more people around the world are inventing the same um, the same thoughts build on, on us being more natural because we're not bo uh, born to lay still watching Netflix. We are born to walk. Um, what do you think? Should people be hopeful or in despair? Well, obviously, there is hope, but you have to make it happen. You've got to believe it, number one. And number two, you've got, to, you've got to commit yourself to doing something about it. 
medication, I'm not knocking medication. There is no medication for Parkinson's that helps you get better. They are treatments, not medication. They're not um, made to make you better. But one last question to finish the other thing off is that your wife, she told you to uh, start this work, walking class. Oh, my late wife, yes. So, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, um, she gave you a little push in the right direction, but it's all you are, the spouse can do. You yourself have to commit, as you say. You see, I trusted her as a person. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. And we worked together all our married lives. And she would not do anything to anybody, enemy or friend. And if she told me something, I knew that it was it was correct. You know, that she wasn't telling me lies or some ulterior motive or anything like that. She believed it because she saw it happen. So I she, didn't believe it because I didn't see it happen. But you, tr and, you trusted her. Uh, well, that's the whole point. I knew her as a person and well, me, men don't like to give in to people, you know, it's, it's weakness. And, uh, but I gave in to her to give it a try, at least. And it worked. So I think that's a good way to end, that you should give it a try and uh, trust a the real process. try everything you put into it and how for how uh, many weeks or months should people try for example fast walking well if if in six months they haven't found anything it's not going to help them if uh, you, you've got to believe and you've got to put everything into it not i'll try it you know i'll see if it works That's give it a good. real try for several months and maybe until half a year and note symptoms maybe once a week or something so you can follow the yes, absolutely yeah so well, thank you for taking the trouble to contact me um, i really do appreciate it and, yeah it um, was uh, gary sharp that that uh, got us together so okay. but i'll say thank you here in this interview